Welcome to Mainland, your local regional television station. I'm Graham O'Brien and some of the stories coming up in today's news. Jan Zoon, a World Award winner, Progress Nelson on Southern Link benefits, market stakeout before visit and more. Project Jan Zoon Trust has received international recognition for the good environmental work that it is doing in our Abel Tasman National Park. The Charitable Trust stood up against more than 500 other nominations from around the world for this award. Project Jan Zoon was named the Worldwide Gold winner in the Conservation, Habitat and Diversity section of the Green World Environmental Awards held in Christchurch on Monday. Others nominated in this category were from countries as diverse as the United Kingdom, Poland, Malaysia and Korea. Over the last 20 years, the Green World Awards and associated Green Apple Awards have been established as the UK's major recognition for international environmental endeavours amongst countries, companies and communities. This award marks another acknowledgement for Project Jan Zoon, who has also both the, won both the Supreme Award and Philanthropy and Partnership category at New Zealand's Premier Environmental Awards, the Green Ribbon Awards 2015 held in June. Chrissy Small caught up with Project Jan Zoon's director, Devin McLean, about this latest award. Devin McLean, when did you first know that you were nominated for this award? Um, it actually came as a result of the Green Ribbon Awards in New Zealand uh, last year, so we got an invitation to see whether we would put our pro project up. So, uh, so we've sort of known it was in process, but it was only a week or so ago that we found out that there was an award and we didn't know what that was until Monday. So. Okay, so what was the reaction when you were, when you were told the news? Yeah, I'm very excited. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a good event. There were people from uh, actually all over the world there in Christchurch on, on Monday, from uh, Poland, the UK, uh, Colombia, uh, Korea, Malaysia, um, and the United Arab Emirates, so different uh, award winners in different categories. So, yeah, exciting to be there. So, were you there? I was there. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of pets on the back? Oh yes, yeah, and uh, and lots since, as people uh, uh, have heard about it. So no, it's really exciting. It's a real team effort, isn't it, Project Jansoon? It's very much the partnership, and so we took our, uh, our key partners, the Birdsong Trust from from uh, the Able Tasman and Department of Conservation. Obviously, we work very closely with them, so we see it as a partnership, and that's part of the recognition as uh, as the partners working together for this um, huge team effort. What does it mean for Project Jansoon now? I think it, the uh, key thing is that uh, international recognition that uh, what we're doing is uh, a little bit special. Um, uh, Roger Wallens, who's the director of the Green World Awards, uh, commented to the media that um, he thought that the aspects of a, of a, of a philanthropic organisation and uh, Department of Conservation and, and other trusts working together was pretty unique and that was one of the aspects that they particularly liked about the project. So nice to get that uh, model out there and uh, have other people looking at it and hopefully it'll inspire some other philanthropists to take a look at working on a similar basis. Well that's good news and uh, now tell me how is it going in there in the Able Tasman? Oh, we're really excited, um, you know, this, we've made great progress on, on the weed control, most of the pines are now gone from the park, the invasive uh, conifers, we've got another big weed program working. Uh, two weeks ago we brought our first kaka back into the park, so they're currently at our release aviary in the top of the park and on the 4th of November we'll be releasing them um, into, into the park. They're all girls because we think the only ones left in the park are a few boys. So we're hoping that um, that's going to work out well and we'll be bringing more, more kaka in. So, yeah, it's nice to be sort of feeling like the securing side of the project is, is getting under control and we can move on to the restoration piece. Right. Well, there's obviously a lot of work. A lot of people have been involved in this and uh, looks like we're going to have some great weather over the summer to, to do more. Absolutely. Unfortunately, we're going to have another beach mast as well, so that'll add some complications, but uh, we'll work our way through that. Mm. Yes, yes. of course, that brings in all the rodents and uh, they come in in a great force of numbers, I believe. Yes, they do. And the last one was only the summer before last, so uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a challenge, but... Um, we're working on that and um, the birds are thriving anyway, so that's great. 1080, has that been an issue for Project Jansoon at all? Uh, it hasn't really been an issue. I mean, obviously it was a, it was a conversation we needed to have with the community to be ready for the, for the beach mass last time. Um, in the end, we had really great support uh, from the community and the concession operators and so on. 
it's, a, it's just a, an essential tool for those circumstances where we know we're going to have masses of food in the park and the rodents are just going to th go through the roof and they did exactly what the scientists had told, the, told us they would in terms of population. So mice spiking, rats spiking, stoats following that. Um, it's something we're going to have to deal with from time to time and at the moment that's still the best tool. What about the effects of 1080 on the, the newly introduced kaka? Um, all of the uh, studies around uh, these birds indicate that there's no issue uh, with them and uh, I think really the only issues that we've had with 1080, not in this park but in other places have been with, uh, well particularly with Kia in a couple of places where they become habituated to living around people and they become so curious about the things we do so a new palette in the environment is of interest to them. Um, but the doc scientists have done a great job of their monitoring of a range of species now and uh, we can't say that no birds ever die but we can certainly say that the populations improve significantly as they get a chance to breed uh, free of the problem. Yeah. Devon, look, thank you very much for your time. Congratulations to the whole team from mainland and I'm sure the community. It's, what a great job. Thanks, Chrissy. That's great. On a quiet day in Nelson Montgomery car park, six uniformed officers, a couple in plain clothes and some serious looking guys in dark suits will always draw attention from your local mainland TV roving reporter. However, on further investigation, I discovered that this is the amount of people, time and effort that goes into preparing for a visit from royalty to our market. As you would quite rightly expect, no one would give an interview on the security preparations being discussed. Wildfires are everyone's nightmare and with the windy season upon us as we've all experienced lately, added to that a long dry summer on the menu, forest and scrub fires are a real threat to our environment and worse, people's lives. Chrissy Small caught up with Rural Fire Chief Ian Reid about how people can help prevent fires this season as the risks continue to grow. Ian Reid, we're coming up to that season where we don't like it, but unfortunately the summer does bring on the, the more dangerous aspects of, of the potential for fire. Um, we've just had some rather large winds. This in a fire is, is pretty precarious. How's the situation at the moment for rural fire? Uh, well, like you say, the winds elevate the risk considerably, especially in scrub fuels like gorse and fern and bracken. Uh, they have two effects. One is that they dry everything out, so they're drying the grass out at a faster rate than, than normal. And the other thing is if a fire does start, then it'll be fanned by the wind and, uh, and it will spread a lot faster and potentially do more damage. Those sorts of winds that we've seen over the last few days, I mean, they're more like Marlborough winds, aren't they? Well, they are, and the wind that we're getting is a phone wind. It's a southwest wind, so the moisture is coming through off the Tasman Sea, it's been dropped on the west coast and then what's left of that uh, rises up over the hills, heats up and then comes down. So it lowers humidities, we've been getting humidities down in the 20% range which is uh, really unheard of for this time of the year. Um, so combined with low humidity, strong winds um, and, uh, and high temperatures that's sort of a recipe for, for good fire weather. Now, look, you know, this is, this is about people now realising that there is a higher risk at this, at this time, mm. and it's probably going to go throughout summer. So what can they do to help stop or prevent fires or even protect themselves if there should be a fire in their area? Uh, well, for a start, all fires in the open air need a permit, uh, and we, at some point, if it continues like it is, we will be restricting permits. We are issuing them um, with a with a very big caution um, around lighting them if it's going to be windy or forecast to be windy. Uh, people, when the, when the grass starts to cure and starts to brown off, um, and, and that's happening in some parts of the district even now, we had, we've had two fires that have spread from controlled burns in the, since the weekend. Uh, one that burned half a hectare, much to the owner's surprise, um, where he thought the grass wouldn't burn. Um, so it's it's really a, a a matter of ensuring that if they have a fire, they put it out, and if they've had a fire in the previous two months, check regularly to make sure that it's out. If there's a pile of ashes there, there could be hot ashes underneath. Um, when mowing uh, or grinding or welding, anything in the outdoors, be very careful. And once the grass starts to cure, even things like parked vehicles and long grass can start fires with exhaust, and particularly four-wheelers, those kinds of things. So anything that's a heat source, um, be very careful around it. 
Uh, we're coming into the fireworks season, and I guess you know the community needs to be vigilant and diligent um, to to look out for those people that uh, um, may not be using fireworks in a sensible manner, and uh, and watch out for them. We had a number of fires last year around fireworks um, in Guy Forks. Uh, I'd like to think we don't have the same thing this year. Right. Um, yes, I've witnessed a hoon throwing a firework out of a car which started a scrub fire. Fortunately, mm. I was there, so it didn't go far. But, mm. you know, those sorts of things, people just do thoughtless acts. Um, this must be your worst nightmare. Well, it is, um, particularly if it's completely preventable like that. Uh, people need to be reminded if they start a fire like that in the rural environment, um, they are liable for the cost of putting it out and any damage that it does. Um, and that's material damage. Uh, think about the, the damage that you're doing to, to people's lives, livelihoods and, and families um, right. that, that that fire could do. Well, fire's a dangerous thing, we all know that, and people have lost their lives recently with the caravan fire just here locally. Yeah. Um, how can people report an idiot? 111. Uh, you know, um, just call 111. Uh, or if you've, if, if, and, uh, and report the smoke um, uh, or the activity, either to the police or the fire service um, through Firecom, and, and we'll get to hear about it. The other thing that people can, can do coming into summer is to make sure, have a look around their property. Um, if a wildfire was to come through from outside, it's usually embers landing on the property that'll, that'll burn it down. So, you know, make sure the gutters are, f are free of l dried leaves and uh, material anywhere on your deck that uh, where, where embers can blow and, and gather, you know, um, take care of that. Take away the needles um, from around the edge of the house and, and the burnable material. If you can, replace it with rock and thin out your vegetation sort of away from the house so that a fire can't carry right up to your house. Right. Now... In situations with rural fire, do you rely on volunteers or is it a bigger, more organised organisation than that? <laughs> no, we, we rely solely on volunteers and if it wasn't for them, uh, we would have uh, some very damaging large fires in this district. Uh, last year we burnt a big sum total of just under six hectares and the reason uh, why that number was so low, and it was low the year before too, as, as well, is that our volunteers get out there and get onto it very quickly. And, uh, and knock it down before it does damage. So, you know, every time they get called out, um, it is a disruption to, to them and their lives and their families, but it's what's what they've volunteered to do and, and we're very grateful for the for what they what they do provide. Right. You know? Now, we've had situations where people have been prosecuted. We've had one man caught doing an arson in a forest. We've had other people caught up with having a little burn off which got out of control. There is a warning there, isn't there? Well, there is, um, and you know, there's always, I guess, people in society that are not so well, and and could potentially, um, uh, you know, become arsonists. And I guess that's the whole community: be diligent, and if and if you realise there's somebody that may be doing that sort of thing, you know, get hold of authorities and 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 talk to them about it, because there is help for people like that. Uh, there are programs in place that agencies run for for that kind of thing, and. Uh, yeah, it's it's you know if, if it's the community's issue, and it's really the community that's got to got to deal with it. We're really the um, the facilitators of uh, you know the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff when we're responding, mm. but we can also help out with preventative campaigns and and advice on how to how, how people can keep themselves safe. So, you know, feel free to get hold of us. Okay, people's advice now. You've given us some good good tips to keep safe and keep fire away um, and now it's just people's common sense don't light it if you don't have to yeah keep an eye on those uh, mountains over by Mount Arthur if you see the clouds sitting in between in between the mountains and rolling over this way it means the wind's going to blow the same with uh, you know Ben Nevis or um, Gordon's Knob the mountains to the to the west if they've got a cloud cover over them a wind cap um, then it's going to blow so you know and have a look at the weather forecast Met Service is a great thing Mm. Ian Reid, thank you very much and let's hope you have a, a break this, this summer. Yeah, here's to a quiet summer, thanks. The Southern Link debate continues with Craig Dennis, Chairman of Progress Nelson Tasman, who came into our studio this week to share his organisation's views on the proposed arterial route. Craig Dennis, thanks for coming in and talking to us today. 
Well, you're welcome. Thank you yeah, for you, having me, Graham. You're the chairman of the Na Progress Nelson Tasman Group, which is looking at the Southern Link. Um, I heard you speak the other day at council as, as well, and um, we'd like to hear a bit more about where you come from in this in this debate and and your group's um, perspective on the Southern Link. Well, Progress Nelson Tasman's only been around since June this year. It formally came together, and we are a group, a coalition of organisations that support the Southern Arterial. And I think it's really interesting why that came about. In effect, a bunch of coffee conversations and dinner conversations, uh, a, a number of individuals around our community were really concerned with whether our city is going. And some are saying stagnating, some are saying actually going backwards. That's a really, that is a real concern. So the group started to generate a, a, a big to-do list. The thing that kept coming out was the linkage between the rest of our region and our city and port, the Southern Ontario. And so the group decided that we would focus on one issue at a time. We've picked up on the Southern Arterial as the key, the key enabler for our community. And so we're out there now. Okay, and um, what groups have come on board um, with, you, with Nelson Tasman, uh, Nelson, sorry, Progress Nelson Progress Tasman. Progress Nelson Tasman. So, so we've been talking to businesses, community groups, producer groups, recreational groups, um, anybody who, who's willing to actually talk to us. Um, in the four months that we've been formed, the I guess the key groups, I'm going to have to rely on my memory here, but the key groups we've got on board are uh, the newly formed group, the, the, the motel and hotel hospitality group is now one called Accommodation New Zealand, just recently merged in the last couple of weeks, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, AA, um, the Contractors Association, um, the Waimea Business Group, the I want, uh, the Tahuna Business Group, um, and, a, and a number of others. There's also a number of organisations that we're talking to where they've said, yes, we support what you do, but we're not prepared to publicly sign up with you at this point until we've had a mandate from our membership. So there is a number of groups that are, we've asked, we've said, yep, that's absolutely fine, but go survey your guys. Yep. The Chamber did it back early in the year, overwhelming response from the business community supporting the Southern Arterial. Um, so some of these other groups are now out there surveying them, their membership to, to formally um, come on board. Um, so we expect this to grow over the next three, four, six months. Sure, um, and, and they're quite big groups. I mean, they're, they're quite outspoken yes. um, groups around town that we, we hear quite a lot of. Yes, yes, yeah. Can't give you names right now, but those groups bring significant numbers of people. So, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Um, And how about, um, the detrimental effects to the areas that that, that was raised in the in the meeting yep. on uh, last Friday, yes. um, and especially for me that I've been involved with the Woodburner Group, and the mayor came out just last week and said that you know even though the rest of the city might get woodburners, the Victory and, and Washington Valley area won't be getting any more than likely because of the emissions levels. Yeah, that seems to be a significant stumbling block for the Southern Arterial Route. If you go back to 2004, there were three key reasons that the Environment Court uh, went against progressing. One was around pollution, one was around severance, and the third issue was around NZTA's own work in investigating options. Go to the pollution one. The, if we go back to 2002, there were 89 exceedances in the victory area in, in terms of above standards go forward a decade to 2012, that had dropped to two. So the council needs to be congratulated. They've actually done a, in a, an amazingly good job in this space. I think at the same time, we in the last decade, we've had uh, quite a lot of tightening up in terms of emissions around fuel, trucks, etc., and that will continue to happen. So I, our group doesn't believe the, the pollution argument stacks up the same as it did over a decade ago. No, I know, certainly it doesn't. Um that, but this is because they've taken the wood burners out and the, and the people have actually, I mean, rather than the council doing sure. the work, the, the people are the ones that have been made to have increased power bills, take out their, sure. take out their wood burners. I mean, we've had a number of public meetings about, sure. and, and also they're, they're starting to um, test for PM 2.5s, yes. and Victory area is 40%, I think, over the PM 2.5s, the WHO sure. um, house standards, and we know diesel motors are one of the main, sure. main so producers of PM2. A couple of points on that, Graham, I think a couple of key points is um, what is what has fires got to do with a transport corridor? 
So I think emissions. Emissions. I think we need to. I don't. I think there are two separate issues around um, around wood burners versus the argument of for the Southern Ontario. The second issue. The second issue is is um, we've. I think we're all struggling a little bit to get real clarity around the the emissions from vehicles. Part of the argument is around the fact that we've got congestion and we've got these things idling that's no good for anybody, versus free-flowing traffic and what that results in. I'm not actually 100% sure on that. No mm. one has been able to demonstrate the outcomes of that. Yeah. So a little bit more work around that. But if you go back to that basic core science, scientific data, if you look at the number of uh, pollution exceedances a decade ago versus now, it's significantly different. Yeah, because they've taken all the wood burners out and, and, and yeah. people are on power and, and people have been put onto heat pumps and... And, and so I still come back to though the question though is I, I, don't, I think it's unfair to bring the wood burner debate into the southern arterial debate. To me they're two very distinct different things. Um, yeah, I, I won't get too much but I mean you're talking about emissions in the area and we're talking about that level where it's, it's held in that valley. So Sure. Um, you, you're saying you can't have a wood burner, but you can have a road with with trucks, diesel trucks on it. Oh, I'm not saying you can't have a wood burner. I'd love a wood burner. <laughs> Many I think people we all will. would. Yeah. The 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 issue there is uh, is is clean burning dry wood. So. Sure. Yeah. 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 And, and, and that's that's definitely the case as well, yeah. and more and new technology as well. Yeah. Um, and getting away from that, you. you um, I know in the uh, meeting on Friday you were quoting that Nelson is stagnating or going backwards and there were figures of, of growth in Nelson of 8.3% which is the second highest in, in yeah. the country. Yeah. I mean everyone, and why wouldn't they, they seem to be one of moving here. I mean what are they moving here for? Yeah. So, and a lot of people coming from Auckland so of course they're yeah. sick of traffic and roads. So. The, the, point, the point I was making there was yes, in, in many metrics our region is doing really well. We're set, uh, from Stats New Zealand, we are the second highest growth yeah. region relative to Auckland. Yep. Auckland 8.5, Nelson 8.3. Even the Tasman District, which has got uh, more population than Nelson City now, is growing at 6%, which is the second highest behind Nelson in the South Island. Wow. There is a lot of growth here. Yeah. Um, now, I know that in, in some ways there's a little bit of a skew to some of our, uh, to us older, older guys. As, and that's for good reason, lifestyle. Um, at the same time though, if you look at the commercial level of activity, the point I was making was around that. Anecdotally, look at the, the volume of, or the number of vacancies around our city currently. Um, talking with some of those businesses, they have very real concerns around what that's doing from their own businesses. We also have anecdotal evidence of, of uh, service companies as well as retailers shifting to Richmond. And we have some statistical evidence which shows that the growth, particularly uh, out of Richmond CBD now, um, in terms of its total spend, is, is markedly increasing over time. In other words, ret particularly retail activity and now some of the professional firm activity is, is starting to come out of the Richmond area. Yeah. I've lived in Richmond for um, since we shifted here in 2002 but I've always felt that Nelson City is is the hub of this place it's our cultural heartland it's it's where our crafts and, and our arts um, should be if we don't turn that stagnation from a commercial point of view how long is that going to remain I don't think so I spend a lot of my life in, in Auckland and the common comment from Aucklanders is, is we love to come to Nelson you have such great boutique shopping well, I would challenge that now. If you walk down the main street of Trafalgar now, how many boutique shops have we got? Mm. They are all national chains. And, and the ones that are left are being pushed to the peripheral or not there at all. I think it's a very different scene from a decade ago. I think that's a, that's a long line to draw from the Southern Link to the loss of the artisans' shops in, in, in Nelson. I mean, the, I mean sure. the rental of the shops in Nelson are in comparison to Auckland Queen Street. Sure. So, so, this, so Progress Nelson Tasman, um, there's a, no, a number of planks or, or as we say enablers around what the Southern Arterial brings. Yes, it is a, cor it is a transport corridor, but we, we say it's more than a transport corridor. Yes, we need a safe, reliable, efficient way to move people and goods from, from region to city and to port go beyond the transport corridor argument though, then we get into a, n a number of facets. One is that commercial reality of what's happening in the CBD. 
But there's another, a, a number of other aspects. Um, freight is projected to grow significantly over the next 20 years. Um, where's that gonna go? We don't have rail. Secondly, just two weeks ago, the, the Waimea Dam, they're talking about 1,200 hectares of, of additional irrigated land. Translate that into freight volumes. Where is that gonna go? Can our existing, can our existing corridors handle it? No, they can't, they weren't designed for those volumes. Um, talk to the the um, talk to the emergency services guys, and and if you say if you ask them the question, do you need an additional corridor? They will say yes for resilience and reliability, speed to journey. Um, they will say things like um, the St John's guys will say you know every minute lost for us potentially can be a life in an yep. ambulance situation. The fire guys will say uh, a, a fire will double every minute, every additional minute will double the size of a fire. Mm. That is all time. So, so we've got an argument around that. Another argument around is we have potentially a world-class promenade around our, around our foreshore. Um, that generates recreational opportunities, commercial opportunities, sporting opportunities, events opportunities. Mm. Right now, you can't, you, you're very limited in what you can do because you're sharing that with 56 tonne trucks going past. Sure. There's, a, there's a fundamental clash. If we can shift that away, then all that good money for the cyclists, for the pedestrians, can come to really good use. Right now, I think we're really challenged that that's the case. Is it? Craig Dennis, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Great work. Thank you. After the break, we'll bring you the latest weather update and some events and happenings coming up from around the region. Why would you want to pay as much as $1,000 for a single bed mattress when you can buy a high quality locally made mattress like this for as little as $220? And a queen size mattress could cost you in excess of $3,000, but at Nelson Beds you could have a mattress like this as low as $425. So why would you go out and spend a fortune on your child's bedroom when you can come to Nelson Beds and buy a complete single mattress and base set, a 7 drawer scotch chest, a headboard and a 3 drawer bedside cabinet for as little as $979? So call and discuss our custom manufacturing options and local after sales service at Nelson Beds, Nelson's only bedding manufacturer. Nelson Tire Centre, great prices, great service. Buy your own Bryford trailer, all types, all sizes. See Colin Douglas for your tires and batteries. I'm Francis from Nelson Auto Glass. We repair all auto glass, stone chips, windscreen replacements, scratch removal. If you have an auto glass issue, our team will sort it. Nelson Auto Glass Specialist, 84 Vanguard Street, Nelson. Edward Gibbon, the bathroom specialist, have a great range of bathroom ideas at their showroom at 23 McGlashan Ave in Richmond. Call in and check out some of the latest bathroom designs and fittings. Edward Gibbon, the bathroom plumbing and drainage supply specialist, 23 McGlashan Ave, Richmond. Victory 60 Plus is on Tuesdays at 1.30 through to 3.30pm at 238 Upper Vanguard Street. You can join in for cards, games and a cuppa. On behalf of the team here at Mainland Television News, thank you for joining us and we'll bring you the latest news and events from around the region again tomorrow. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air. Nelson Tire Centre. Great prices, great service. Buy your own Bryford trailer. All types, all sizes. See Colin Douglas for your tires and batteries. <laughs>